This is a University of Otago podcast. Thank you for being here, John. Oh, thanks, Eric. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I, I work for Vanguard Consulting. It's an international company based in the UK. It has a presence in New Zealand and Australia where I work. Um, I actually live in Alexandra, so I'm not far away, uh, but work around um, Australasia. Uh, I came, we're one, one trick pony basically, uh, Vanguard Consulting, we help leaders change thinking, that's all we do. And, um, and I came across them about 10 years ago when I was CEO of a local authority, uh, that was the third local authority I'd been a leader of. Um, I started when I, in the 1980s, before amalgamation as a leader of a local authority, another one in the 1990s, another one in the 2000s. Um, and in all that time I never had an HR executive because I thought it was waste. Um, and so I really got hands, uh, hands on in, um, how many HR people are there here? Okay, okay. so we can talk about that later. Um, but we, I got, because um, I got, I, so uh, what the, the reason I'm saying that is not to poke fun at HR people, um, is it's because I, um, I had to get hands on in all of those things myself and really, and so I've got a very practical understanding of that I suppose. And, and what I, what I, I'm a bit of a socialist, um, so I, I had that feeling that actually I wanted people to earn more and how could I get that to happen? What I understood, I had to actually help productivity improve in the organisation to truly be able to get people to, um, to get more pay. So I went and researched ways that that could happen. And um, that's, and, and what I understood after that is I had to increase the size of the pie, basically, if I wanted people to, pay, to be paid more. But what I also had to avoid was um, the lion's share going to executives because that would mean there's only a little bit left for the little people. Um, so this view that because jobs are becoming more difficult, I want to challenge this view that because jobs are getting more difficult, we need rare skills and therefore these rare skills can demand higher salaries. Okay. Um, because that notion I think is flawed and actually, if this doesn't work I'm going to have to use that, um, that notion is flawed from my experience and I'm not going to give you any data, I'm going to give you evidence, okay, I'll just distinguish it because you can always fool around with data, like if we took the, the detail that was on there that said there's been no change, if we change the baseline to 27 years ago, there's been a significant change in um, sal uh, salaries. So you can manipulate data. I could manipulate that data to paint quite a different picture. Um, I'm not going to give you data, I'm going to give you evidence. And the, um, the thing I'm going to, the, the proposition I'm going to make is that actually rather than being, how do I get this to move on? This, this maybe, next would be a start. proposition I'm going to make while we sort out the data, uh, the data projector, is that um, rather than being unusually good or remarkable, we are, so it's that one there, great, rather than being unusually good or remarkable, um, rare skills are actually a symptom of poor organisation, or the need for rare skills are a symptom of poor organisation design and inferior thinking about, um, which then leads to poor organisational performance. Um, so, so rewarding them is only embedding that poor organisational performance. And um, to support this proposition, let's first take how we think about business purpose. So what's the purpose of every business? Every private enterprise, what do they see as their purpose, do you think? Just as a whole, what would they be? Give me some feedback. Yeah, shareholder value, I saw someone whisper profit here. That's what, that's what um, most businesses, and so the, organi the, the business leader sets up their business, designs their business so they make a profit, right? Makes sense? Um, problem is, that's not the purpose, the reason for existence of every business, and this is a fundamental problem in the way in which people think about business. The fundamental purpose is to serve customers because without customers there is no reason for existence. That is their purpose. That's every business, every non-profit's uh, purpose, reason for being. And if we don't 
actually have that, we create a de facto purpose, which is to make a profit or a non-profit organisations, it's actually to keep to budget. That become, or if you put both those together, what I've found is that in fact the real de facto purpose comes make the numbers. And when we make the numbers, things are okay and I can get more pay or whatever it is. So, so that's what people pay attention to. And the results, this results in leaders designing their business <coughs> to do unhelpful things, but they will, the businesses will make the numbers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, get, I'm going to give you some evidence of three organisations, two of which I was directly involved in, and one I wasn't because it's in the UK, um, that changed their thinking, became cost, customer focused and profoundly changed performance. Okay, so the first one is, um, uh, so the measures I'm going to use to help you understand that is service, efficiency, revenue for the private firms and cost for the public firms and worker morale. So I'm going to compare those four things before and after to see what impact it had on performance. First one is very large organisation, uh, a telco, over 50,000 employees, um, in Australia, operating in Australia, we worked with this organisation in a particular part of it to see the utility of changing the way in which, uh, changing thinking and see where that could impact. The results were like this, um, MPS, you heard of MPS, familiar, so it's Net Promoter Score, um, it means that if you, it's how likely a customer is to recommend you to others, okay? Um, before we started, it was minus 14. That means most people wouldn't recommend. After, it was plus 70, which meant actually almost everybody would recommend the service to someone else. Um, the other indicator of service is failure demand. This is the demand that comes into the organisation because customers actually don't get what they want. Okay? Uh, that was one in, uh, sorry, four in five demands into the organisation were failure demands after the process of changing the way in which they thought about the work and focusing on the customer, it became one in four demands. So it changed from 80% to 25% of all their demand. Um, <clears throat> the, what they found in terms of efficiency is that at the front end they could only answer 20% of all calls that came in at the front end, one stop. But actually when they looked at the type of work, they saw that if they changed their system, thought about work differently, Actually, 80% of it was possible to be dealt with at the front end, not requiring a handoff, which requires a whole lot of, you know, a whole, whole lot of extra work. And so they, in, a year, within the next year, they worked at things like um, functional design of work, access to IT systems, uh, tra appropriate training, and had trebled the amount that they could deal with at the front end, dramatically improving efficiency. Um, revenue. The impact of listening to the customer ended up when they got a new customer turn up in their outfit um, wanting to join, they got an eight-fold increase in revenue from that customer to what the experience was when you got new customers in previously. And morale in the organisation was, you know, the change was palpable really. The, uh, that this, this, this comment echoed often when we talked to people who are engaged in the work. You know, we've always been scared to say who we work for when out at social environments. Now I'm really proud of what we're doing. So massive change, profound change in all three or four elements of um, performance. Another example, this is one that I was directly involved in as the CEO. Uh, Resource Consent, Central Otago District Council, um, when we looked at all of the national, the national performance targets that we were given, we are actually performing okay, but we knew that customers weren't all that happy, so we actually went and understood what the problems were, and what we found is that actually speed of consent, major, major consideration for customers. Um, we were doing an average of 52 days end-to-end, -end. customer turns up 52 days, late, two day, 52 days later, they'd get their consent on average, uh, but the maximum amount was 120 days. So we could guarantee that we'll get your consent within four months. Um, now we changed that down to a month was the maximum and 11 days was the average, end to end. Okay. Next thing we looked at was efficiency, further information, requests was our measure of efficiency. This is the, how often we'd send 
um, the customer back to give us more information. It was 70% of consensus when we started, dropped to 15. But actually, that massive improvement in um, service happened with, for lower cost. So cost dropped, and we had um, had morale increase again. The uh, you know the, the planner planners who were doing this um, could now do planning work, is what they said. That's what they really enjoyed. In fact, one of them said that actually the most significant tool I had in the old world was um, number recognition, because when a customer rang up, who I knew I hadn't got the consent ready, I'd just go to, let it go to message bank and not answer the call. And I'd call them back later, a few days later when I'd actually finished. So now I can do real planning work and I'm not worried about those customer complaints. The last, um, last example I'm going to give you is a UK example because I think you know, health's a bit topical in Dunedin at the moment. Um, the, these guys, uh, what they did is they, they changed the focus on rather than putting people through a standard process of care, they really understood the customer and then designed their treatment for that customer. And what happened was um, the key service measure, and they, they knew that you know, this is the best way to give treatment to stroke people, was to have them 90% of the time in the acute stroke, stroke unit. So the number of patients that it happened for increased from 22% to 80%. The, um, those who received rehab of those who needed it, increased from 50% to 100%. was another um, service improvement. But interestingly, when you look at efficiency, it said because, um, because they were getting more of the appropriate care, they recovered faster. And so we didn't need as many beds. And so the cost of treatment actually declined. So they saved money on the budget but yet provided significantly better performance. And as you can imagine, morale in, the, in such a sort of life, you know, important, um, important uh, treatment, morale transformed from feeling that they, you know, that they were inhibited by the system to actually the fact that they were now help, help, being helped by the system and therefore could help people. But... The, that wasn't an advert for our company, by the way. That wasn't the intention of that. The, the reason I've gone through those is that the, there's the really the important feature of these three examples and all of the systems we work in is that actually the changes were designed and implemented by existing leaders and existing workers. So there were no change in people. Um, the skills require. So the conclusion I'd have is that the actual the skills required to create this level of change, this profound level of performance, is actually available in every organisation, and that's our experience in everyone that we assist. So these people are everywhere; they're not rare. So we don't need to pay them a premium. Um, the problem is uh, they just they're just not commonly applied or the thinking um, isn't commonly applied that is helpful. It is customer focused rather than meet the numbers um, focus. Now, alternatively, so that, that's, that's one view. Alternatively, we can, look at, um, we can look at what happens when we put shareholder value or profits, you know, meet the numbers, um, before the customer. Starting with a high profile event, that required rare skills. Now we all know that bank executives had to negotiate with governments around the world to um, negotiate bailouts after the GFC. That was an application of rare skills. Trouble is, what, what caused the GFC? GFC was caused simply because um, there was an unfettered drive to make the numbers and improve the numbers because we had associated bonuses, performance enhancements and performance incentives that cause people to do unhelpful things for customers, led to the GFC. So in the face of those four examples, one could assert that rare skills actually may be required to overcome damage done because of the way we design organisations to maximise profits and 
costs because I'm not saying we, should, we shouldn't have profits. Absolutely, we must have profits to be, to, for businesses to continue. But if it is their purpose, if it is their sole, or not even their sole, their main driver, it will create chaos inside um, organisations. And I'll explain how that actually happens uh, if you depart from customer focus. So I'm going to take a, um, I'm going to give you a comparison of how we would help organisations to design for the customer. First thing you've got to do if you're going to do that, you've got to understand the customer. Make sense? And what, what, what we found helpful is that we have to define the problem the customer has. Secondly, you have to understand the demand that will solve that problem. And then the third thing you have to understand is that actually how the customer wants that solved is also important. So the, what matters about the delivery of the, of the demand. Um, and the, significantly, those three things vary. All right? Important, important uh, part of the understanding. Now, once we understand that, what we can do is we can start to build methods to allow the organisation to uh, respond to the variety of demand that comes in. So adaptive methods that can respond to the customer's vari variation. Um, and what that results in is customer outcomes. And you've got to have measures that actually identify how close are the outcomes to what the customer wanted in the front. That, that gives you a design with the customer at the centre. Predictably, when we design for profits or budget, you know, meeting the numbers, it looks quite different. Because the first thing leaders think is that it's actually too difficult and expensive to vary products and services to, to customer needs. So they build in st uh, standard product offerings and you know, take Sky subscriptions. I only want Sky for the sport. Can I get Sky only for the sport? No, because I have to pay for everything else. Um, and that's, that's general, that happens in most large organisations. Similarly, um, you know, private, uh, public sector, my example before, you know, 20 working days to get a consent. We tell people that to manage their expectations rather than actually try and understand their expectations and deliver to that. Um, manage, and then the second thing is managers believe that um, they need to push sales of these standard products on customers, contacting them regularly without invitation, normally just around dinner time. And as well, when we, when we, um, when we call them, they try and upsell. That's all pushing sales and ignoring actually what customers want. So we're systematically not focusing on customers. That's the first problem. The second problem is that our response, when we do find out a demand, is focused on or is driven by cost reduction and control. So for instance, managers, uh, managers assume it's helpful to split budgets down to business unit level or below, but all that does is it starts to develop silos and we know the impact of silos. I think everyone has probably experienced that within organisations. It's a very wasteful outcome. The second thing they might do is provide targets because they think that people actually need them to, you know, so that otherwise they'll sit around and do nothing. Um, but the consequence is that it's, the target becomes the focus, not the, not the customer. And then the third thing is that, or well, another thing that uh, managers assume is that they attempt to reduce costs or they, by giving, or they give people scripts and procedures. Um, but that only again leads to restricting the ability of uh, workers to respond to what the customers want. Managers then assume attempts to reduce costs like contracting out based on price, i make that distinction, contracting out based on price, work. But by design through specification, you're actually stopping the contractors to be able to vary their work for what customers need. And it's the same problem hospitals have when the government specifies numbers of, numbers of or agrees with them numbers of interventions and the price, i.e. funding, for those. It leads to the same, the same uh, wasteful activity. Uh, we then have, to save further costs, we divide jobs up 
into front of house and back of house and then wonder why the people at the back of the house who have never talked to the customer don't provide what customers actually want. Um, and that's without mentioning things like offshoring, um, asset procurement based on cost, IT features forcing customers to do more of the work. You know, think things like um, having to select five options on the IVR when none of them suit. Those sorts of things all create waste inside the organisation. So even if we understood the different shapes of customers at the front end, by focusing on cost or reducing, uh, reducing cost, increasing revenue, it manifests in inflexible processes. And then it creates a push to provide for the organisational outcomes. That's what it's designed to do rather than customer ones. And that's what we measure, achievement of the organisational outcomes, not the customer ones. It's not only helpful for the customer, but it's actually costly for the business. Because the story doesn't end there as well, because customers don't go down without a fight. They come back into the organisation with failure demand. This, this, um, this demand that's caused by failure to do something or do something right for the customer. And then worse than that, they actually build processes to deal with the failure demand using the same thinking that caused it in the first place. So they separate back of house, front of house, um, do all those sorts of things that so leads to just slower performance and more grumpy customers ringing back in for the third or fourth or fifth time. And now in all this, spare of thought for the workers because they have to reconcile the demand from the customer and the push on them by the management that has led to all of these things that are constraining performance. And not unexpectedly, worker morale plummets, leading to costly worker engagement strategies. Now faced with this, rather than change design, organisations search for heroes. Um, those people who overcome the challenges, are leaders with rare skills, but not only leaders. Um, there's a systematic requirement to battle the odds in conventional organisations that focus on uh, reducing cost, you know, focus on the numbers. Uh, so, but to prove it's possible, organisations herald these people, expose them out, you know, um, make wonderful examples of them, because they want everyone else to copy that. But rather than rely on some sort of heroics of a few super workers, it's our view that it would be better to design the system so that everybody can do a good job. So to summarise, my proposition is that actually rare skills, you know, the, the reason for, uh, rare skills are required when we by design upset customers. So we then look for heroes who need to solve the systemic conflict between the customer and the organisation. The skills needed to improve performance Second point, skills need to improve performance against customer needs are common. They're actually in every organisation, and, and our evidence is in the UK, around the world, South Africa, Europe, New Zealand, Australia, is that those skills are available. We just stop, or we just don't think about the work in the way that is helpful for them to be used. And thirdly, um, you know, cons current considerable pay differentials for leaders, um, and I used to be one, and I certainly had what I considered to be a reasonable, a, a considerable pay differential between me and other people in the organisation. Um, they are, they would seem to be a consequence of the first conclusion. It's much more difficult to manage the chaos creating, created by not designing for the customer but instead designing for numbers to achieve numbers. So if you pay on job difficulty, then they deserve it. But the ironical thing is that, of course, their collective thinking about work has actually caused it. Um, it's not intentional. It's just very unfortunate.